Well, preparing to live stream the webinar. One second while it does its thing. Are you guys still seeing the slideshow? Okay. The red bar is moving, done, redirecting to YouTube. So it looks like we are live. Nice. So. All right, so I think I did that, we'll hope. Anyway, um, good evening, everyone. My name is Katie Malinowski, and I am the Executive Director of the Tug Hill Commission in Watertown, New York. Welcome tonight to um, our last webinar of our three-part series on forest conservation. The Commission and the Land Trust are excited to be presenting this last webinar of our three-part series. If there are any other topics you'd like us to consider presenting in the future, please put them in the chat. We are always looking for ideas um, on things people wanna learn more about. Our speakers tonight are Neil Bungard, Jason Drobnak, and Linda Garrett. Here are brief bios for each of them and then we will get started. So Neil Bungard works in the state and for private forestry branch of the US Forest Service. In his position, Neil works with the 20 states of the Eastern region on forest land conservation. Neil has worked with forest land conservation programs with the US Forest Service since 2000 and with the US Forest Service since 1998. I must have had a mistake there, sorry, Neil. Um, switching to Jason. Jason Drobnak is the private forestry and forest utilization lead in DEC's division of lands and forests. Jason spent most of his forestry career in DEC Region 4, working as a field forester in both private and public lands programs, but working with landowners in the forest stewardship program was the most rewarding and fun. He is a proud graduate of SUNY ESF's Ranger School and SUNY ESF. He lives with his wife, daughter, and Springer Spaniel in beautiful Schoharie County, which he says is not a bad place to quarantine. He enjoys all the usual stuff foresters like... <laughs> <laughs> such as hunting, fishing, camping, and kayaking, as well as classic movies. Switching to Linda, Linda has been the executive director of Tug Hill Tomorrow Land Trust since 2002. She works with staff, private landowners, and partners to protect working lands in and around Tug Hill and Fort Drum and provides outdoor and educational programs for kids and, general, and the general public throughout the region. To date, the Land Trust has protected over 20,000 acres and raised over $10 million for land protection. So a little bit of housekeeping, please use the chat function, which some of us have already been using at the bottom of your screen to ask questions and to interact with um, the attendees and panelists. We will try to keep an eye on the chat and answer questions throughout the presentation. We also have some interactive polls for you to answer as we go. So watch for those to pop up on your screen as well. And if you stay to the end, Linda will be giving away two Tug Hill Natural History Field guides. Guides. So we hope you will find this presentation informative. And again, thank you for being here tonight. And with that, I'm going to just do a few introductory slides. Hopefully this will. Um, first is a poll. Let me launch the poll. So the question is, how would you describe yourself choosing one of these op options? a town board member, a planning board member, forest landowner, employed in the wood products industry, an agency staff member, or just an interested member of the public. So I'll give you a few minutes to answer that. It looks like just about everyone's voted. So I'm gonna end the polling and show your, you the results. So we have quite a few forest landowners at seven, um, a lot of people that are just interested in several planning board members. So can you all see those results? Yes, okay. So that gives us a flavor of who we've got here tonight. Next, I have um, a map that uh, Linda and I pulled off, uh, I think the Forest Service website or DECs, I can't remember, but it basically just shows the green is forest land in New York state to give people a real sense of how much uh, forest we're really talking about is, 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 is a lot. Um, some of the facts are New York's land area is 30.2 million acres of land and our state population is around 19.4 million. So um, 
if you break that down to the forest area, we have about 18.6 million acres, 61% of the entire land area of the state, which equals to about one acre of forest per resident. So that's kind of a neat way to think about it. Um, we have a lot of publicly owned forest land, about 3.7 3 million the last time someone counted. But we also have a lot of privately owned forest land, which is the focus really of tonight's presentation for the most part at 76% of the forest land in the state. As well, we have uh, more than 100 types of trees and our most common forest type is the maple, beech, birch um, forest. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Neil. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. So yeah, um, as the bio said, yeah, I've worked with um, Neil. My name is Neil Bungard. We work with the US Forest Service on forest conservation programs. Um, the part of my bio that was a little clunky is I've done the forest conservation program since 2000, but I actually started with the Forest Service in the fall of 1998, based out of Watertown, so not too far from the Tug Hill Plateau in, you know, in that area, um, working on the forest inventory and analysis pro project with Forest Service research, um, remeasuring permanent inventory plots that we have across the state due to the 1998 ice storm. So, um, so that's, so I got my started in the Forest Service kind of in the area that we're uh, talking about today. So uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so this my title, Natural Resource Program Leader, work with the Eastern Region of the US Forest Service, go ahead. So real quick, just quick breakdown of where the US Forest Service and why is somebody from US Forest Service talking about private forest land issues in New York? Um, for US Forest Service is an agency of the US Department of Agriculture. And within the Forest Service, we've got different branches. We've got the National Forest System. So that's where you know, Green, Mountain, Nash, Green Mountain National Forest, Finger Lakes National Forest, Allegheny National Forest, and many others across the country, but those are the three closest to the Tug Hill area um, are managed through the National Forest System. We have to have, also have the research branch of the Forest Service, which as I mentioned is where I started in the Forest Service. And that's a you know, nationwide research branch. They study all sorts of stuff with trees. Uh, some of the stuff way beyond my knowledge level. And then finally, there's the state and private forestry branch of the Forest Service where I'm located. And that's where it's a branch of the Forest Service that works with the state to, work, to try and work at um, sharing knowledge and offering resources to help protect private forest lands. And that's through like forest health, uh, fire and aviation management. So that can be with um, not just putting out fires, but helping with fire management or controlled burns. And then the cooperative forestry program where I'm at, where we have forest land conservation programs, we have urban forestry, forest stewardship. Go ahead. So the first forest conservation program I'm gonna talk about is the Forest Legacy Program. Go ahead. And so the purpose of the Forest Legacy Program is um, to protect private, yeah, to protect environmentally important forest areas that are threatened by conversion to non-forest uses and to promote forest land protection and other conservation opportunities. So a little history about the program is it was authorized in the 1990 Farm Bill. So we're just a little over 30 years old. And it was amended in the 1996 Farm Bill to allow the states to hold the land or conservation easements acquired by the program. So even though it's a federal program using federal funds, um, it's implemented by the states. So if you're interested in Forest Legacy, you'll need to work with the New York State contact and I have a slide that has his contact information here shortly. So as I said, you know, projects can be acquired in fee or fully acquired. So the land is bought and becomes part of a state forest, state park, depending on the, you know, the state that it's in. And, um, or it could be a conservation easement, which I know there was a conservation easement session back in January with this um, group. And it's a nationally competitive program, or pro program. So any application that would come from New York would compete against projects in Montana, California, Hawaii, um, most states are involved in the program. Uh, next slide, please. 
So because it's uh, implemented by the state, one of the things about the Forest Legacy Program is the, the land or the conservation easement must be acquired by the state. The federal government does not come in and acquire the easements or, or the land. This is a state program and it's a cost share program. Um, I skipped a bullet there, sorry. The, uh, so the land or easement that's acquired must be in a designated forest legacy area. And um, this is an area identified by the state through their state forest action plan of where they can implement the forest legacy program based and each forest legacy area has like its own goals. So as I said, it's a cost share program. So the forest legacy program can provide up to 75% of the total cost. And then the other 25% must come from non-federal sources. So if it's a purchase of land that costs $2 million, we could provide up to $1.5 million. So here's a map of the forest legacy areas in New York. Um, if you compare this to the slide that was earlier in the presentation, it pretty much covers most of the heavily forested areas of the state. Um, three of those are kind of cross hatched, kind of hard to see, but those are ones that are currently proposed from the latest uh, forest action plan update that the state of New York did and are in the process of being activated. That would be the Allegheny Plateau area, the um, Finger Lakes, and the Schwangunk Ridge out there near the Catskills. Next. So let's get into some more forest legacy stuff. So this map here shows the existing forest legacy areas that have been approved um, are the kind of the greenish areas. And then the orange splotches going off even into New England and down into Pennsylvania, New Jersey is the um, various projects that have been protect that are forest legacy projects that have been um, protected. Most of those are conservation easements across those areas. You know, just go ahead. And so I went ahead and zoomed in on the Tug Hill Plateau. The colors are a little washed out, but you see there's a big project right in the middle here we call the East Branch of Fish Creek. Um, in the Tug Hill Plateau, you see Oneida Lake down south, Watertown up in the north. And then there's a smaller project, which is one of our first projects down there just north of Utica. That's a little, um, that was one of our first projects back in the 90s. That one's, you know, 25 years old, approximately. East Branch Fish Creek's been around for about 15 years, if I remember correctly. Go ahead. So, um, New York State was one of the first states to participate in the Forest Legacy Program. And in that time, they've done 13 projects across the state in the Forest Lakes areas. And that's 135,000 acres, almost 136,000. And kind of the one thing we like to highlight with state accomplishments or even national accomplishments is, you know, the value of those easements, and I think they're all easements, they'd have to double check, but the value of the protection, the land that was protected is over $34 million, but um, it's only used $12 million from the Forest Legacy Program, so well over the minimum cost share requirements. You know, we could have provided up to 75% of that 34 and so, you know, which is good. It just shows that, you know, the federal dollars are getting further, getting a larger impact due to the non-federal funds coming into these projects. So here's a slide from that East Branch of Fish Creek project when I was out there, I think 2010, during a program review with the state. Go ahead. So the little interesting thing about the Forest Legacy Program is it's funded through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. If you don't know what that is, um, that's a fund set aside that sets aside monies from offshore oil and gas receipts uh, that are federally owned. And it's used to, it's been around since the 60s, and that money goes back into reinvesting into natural resource protection, kind of, you know, you're taking a natural resource and using it for public or for gain. And so, you know, some of that money is going back into protecting land, land or other things using LWCF funds. The next bullet there talking about the Great American Outdoors Act. This was an act that was signed into law in August of 2020. And that permanently fund, permanently fully funds the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Up until that passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, it was subject to annual appropriations of how much money would go to LWCF. And LWCF, it's not just Forest Legacy, it um, funds national forest land acquisitions, which at this point is mostly just kind of in holdings and filling in the edges where there might be um, uneven boundaries or national parks, fish and wildlife refuge. 
And then there's the whole state side LWCF that goes for you know local parks and stuff like that. So every year that was su subject to congressional appropriations of how much money all those programs combined would get. With the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, it's fully funded at $900 million a year, where on average we were seeing about $400 million a year for the last 15 years or so. So what that did to Forest Legacy Program funding is went from $64 million a year for the previous five years to 21, which we're just in, you know, in now, to 94 million. So we immediately saw a $30 million increase in project funding. And you know, I will point out it was, you know, it was for project funding. We didn't see like an increase in administration funds to pay for federal staff or anything like that. It's, it's all going to projects. The Forest Legacy timeline is very long. So if you want to get involved in Forest Legacy, it's going to take some time. The next round for funding consideration will be for 2023 projects. And so a quick layout of the timeline, applications are due to the state this summer. The state reviews them, submits them to the Forest Service in the fall. A project list will be will come up in, um, in late. 2022 or early 2023, depending on when a final budget is passed. And I guess stop there real quick. Even though LWCF is fully funded, it's still subject to congressional appropriations on how much of that $900 million pie. So, it, so we still have to wait for a final budget every year of how much of that $900 million pie the Forest Legacy Program will get. So if the project, you know, if the program is funded or your project is selected for funding through the competitive process, then um, the goal is to have that conservation easement or that land acquired within two years. So it might be 2025 before we'd see a project getting completed that's interested in getting protected through Forest Legacy right now. So again, you know, if you're in it for you're in it for the long haul, if you're interested in legacy, go ahead, please. So I said earlier, it's implemented through the state. And so currently the state contact for the Forest Legacy Program is Jeff Mapes. And there's his email address. He works over in Albany. And then, um, so any project specific or anything about the New York Forest Legacy Program would be directed to Jeff. But we also have the Nash, uh, the, excuse me, the Regional Forest Legacy Program Manager is Kirsten Buchek in Milwaukee. And that's her contact there. I'm sitting in because I've, she's been with Forest Legacy a year and a half. I've been in it for 20 years. So um, she said, go ahead. Yes, you can go ahead and present for me. <laughs> but the other reason why I'm presenting is um, this is the program that I'm the manager for, for the same 20 state Eastern region is the Community Forest and Open Space Conservation Program. So if go ahead and yeah, so the, Community Forest Program is kind of a, some people call it Forest Legacy Light or the Suburban Legacy Program or um, Little Forest Legacy. There's been a lot of names like that. It's similar, but different and has a lot shorter history. So the purpose of the Community Forest Program is to provide grants to eligible entities, which I'll explain, for acquiring private forest lands that are threatened by conversion to non-forest uses. And those forest lands acquired provide public benefits. That's the purpose. The history, instead of being authorized in 1990, was this one was authorized in 2008. So we're only you know 13 years in now. But the one big thing on this is this is implemented at the local level. So the grants from for community forest program go directly from the Forest Service to the eligible entities, which are local units of government, so town or county or city. Um, what we call qualified nonprofits, so basically 501c3s that are in the quote business of land protection and federally recognized Indian tribes. So those are all the eligible entities. The state is not an eligible entity for these funds. The, um, there's also no conservation easements with the community forest program. This is for the acquisition of land to create a community forest, town forest, town woods, you know, Whatever it's called doesn't matter. It's just the local level acquires the land to create a public forest. And again, these projects are also selected on a national, um, nationally competitive basis. Go ahead, please. So unlike Forest Legacy Program, there is no um, community forest areas. 
The only what we call eligible land is private forest lands that are threatened by conversion to non-forest uses, not held in trust by the United States, and um, if acquired, can be provide the community benefits and must be at least five acres in size. That's that's our limit. So there's no must be within a certain geographic area. So any forest land at least five acres in size that's privately owned could be eligible for a community forest program if it's not already protected in some way. And so I mentioned that you know the community forest program is looking to protect forests that provide public benefits. And so the first four bullets, those are the um, what I lovingly refer to the four E, the four E benefits of the community forest program. We've got the economic, educational, environmental, and the recreational benefits of the forest of the community forest program. And so when we say economic, we're looking, you know, is this land going to be used for you know working lands? There'll be periodic um, entry for wood products or educational benefits of, you know, organized school groups or will there be um, just tours by the owning entity or self-guided tours with kiosks and signs. Environmental benefits that we're looking for could be white, you know, anything, water, water protection, wildlife protection, species protection, and then recreational, that's, the, that's an easy one to point to, you know, we'll provide trails, water access, um, you know, hunting and fishing opportunities, depending on the property. But the one thing that's all of this is the, any community forest land acquired is managed under a community forest plan that involves the community at large, not just the acquiring entity, but there's what we look, we're looking for community involvement, that there'll be input from the community on how this property will be managed in the long run. Go ahead, please. So here's a couple other things that are a little bit different. Um, I've already covered the eligible entities, but there they are again, local units of government, eligible nonprofits, federally recognized tribes. Um, for the acquisition of lands for community forest program, it's a 50-50 cost share. So, any, so if it's a, Every dollar of community forest funds, at least a dollar of non-federal sources must be involved in the project. Go ahead. And so because it's a newer program and a smaller program, um, I guess the first thing to point out is it's not funded through the Land and Water Conservation Fund like Forest Legacy. We're funded through the general appropriation and it is looking at smaller tracts of land and we do have a lot smaller budget. Um, there's the budget history, but currently we're at looking at $4 million a year versus Forest Legacy, which was $94 million a year. But with those $94 million, we've done a lot. Uh, go, go ahead. And so here's a map similar to the last one showing um, pretty much the same area of New York and, and Western New England of community forest projects across that range. Um, the green dots are completed community forest projects. The yellow dots are in process ones. And then the few orange dots are showing up are the ones that are currently being reviewed right now as we speak um, for competitive, for the funding for 2021. You know, I, I was reviewing applications earlier today. Neil, we have a question in the chat. Um, the question is, does a project have to have all the benefits to qualify for a community forest grant application? I would, no, you don't have to have all of them, but it's, um, it's kind of hard to, yeah, if you think creatively, you're gonna find something that, that the, a, a forest will provide all because economic benefits doesn't necessarily have to mean going in and cutting of timber, it could be, there's an economic benefit of having a protected forest in town that, you know, keeping the water clean, that's a public water source. So there's an economic benefit there or, you know, berry or mushroom picking by the public that there's an economic benefit to those picking those non-timber products and not having to go pay $20 an ounce or whatever for some special mushroom that grows on the forest. Um, you know, an educational, you know, it can be, you know, as long as it's open for possible school stuff. So 
I guess to reiterate shortly, you know, to shorten it up again is, you know, it doesn't have to, but it definitely helps because it is part of the scoring process as we look at, we are looking for those benefits, but, you know, you can be, have something where that's not a highlight of the property, but um, and still get funding. Thank you. Go ahead. And so because it's a newer program, the first round, even though we started funding in 2010, we didn't actually put the funds out for projects until 2012. So since 2012, there's, there's been two projects in New York State. Both of those are off in the Rensselaer Plateau area out east of Albany. And um, so, so far it's been 703 acres in the state with a little over $600,000 for the acquisition of those 700 acres. And they got $300,000 for the community forest program. So we popped another poll in here um, to, to try to, let me uh, see if I can get this poll up in a second. Uh, see what kind of interest there is. So um, for our attendees, would you be interested in having a community forest somewhere on Tug Hill? So it looks like our results are about two thirds say yes and the other third aren't sure. So some interest in this is a kind of a new concept for Tug Hill. So um, I can understand people not being sure because they haven't really heard too much about it. Right. So back to you, Neil. Yep. It's, even though I have, you know, just gonna kind of maybe quickly address the, the not sure as it could be, there's no forest federal oversight in the long run of this. We're not coming in every year and making sure you're doing what you said you're gonna do. It's, there's a five-year check-in for anyone who gets a community forest saying that it's still being managed as a community forest according to the community forest plan and hasn't been converted to other uses and that's it. You know, we're not looking for detailed reports. We're not coming in to try and get you. There's no big federal oversight on that. So that's, you know, may not be what some of the not sure's are, but I've, I've heard those questions before. Um, let's see, this picture here was from one of the, was they call it the Albert, yeah, the Alberts Community Forest at the, in the Rensselaer Plateau. This one was uh, funded in 2016, I believe. So how Forest Legacy has a long timeline, Community Forest Program has a shorter timeline, generally because um, if people are selling their land in fee, they're not wanting to wait around four years to be able to sell it. They're looking to get rid of it soon, you know, as soon as possible, probably. So as I mentioned earlier, we're right now reviewing projects for 2021 funding. Um, we'll be meeting April 1st. And so, you know, these projects in the applications, let me back up. So the next rounder for funding is 2022. And so those applications will be due based on past years, will be due in January of 2022. And the Forest Service gets those applications from the state. So in this case, it was Jason this year, sent them to me in February. And we come up with a final project list in April and same goal of getting it done within two years, but we've had projects that are funded in, you know, notified that they're funded in May and then they're closing in October, five months later. Um, so those, those dates and times are based on past, um, past timelines. It's generally been that, but it's really dependent on what the request for applications that published in the federal register every year. It has slightly different dates every year, but they've generally been around those January, February, April timeframes. And uh, there's my contact information. There is no state contact. There is a state review role, but um, for questions on the CFP, feel free to go ahead and contact me. Um, at some point when things are opening up more, I'm happy to come out and visit properties. I travel a lot with the, you know, with work with both Forest Legacy and Community Forest. So I can always try and find a way to squeeze a potential site visit in or just talk about a potential project and, you know, answer questions. Thank you, Neil. And I'm going to drop in the uh, chat a couple of links for people if they want to uh, look at any of those websites you that talk more about the two programs that you just uh, gave us an overview on. Thank you. Thank you.
Now we're going to switch gears and uh, Jason's up. Thanks, Neil and Katie. Um, so I'm Jason Drobnak. I am the um, I'm DEC's uh, Division of Lands and Forests private, uh, private forestry lead. Uh, I also am the lead for the Forest Utilization Program. I uh, work out of Central Office in Albany, but I spent, um, I spent lots of time in the field uh, visiting forest landowners uh, and giving them stewardship advice. Uh, working on state lands, uh, doing you know, working with loggers and 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 other foresters, um, doing other you know, doing projects, um, recreation, wildlife, uh, and of course, uh, wood products uh, harvests. So um, you can go to the next slide. So I I always start off all my all my presentations uh, with this slide. I think Katie's probably seen this before at the Forest Action Clan stuff. <laughs> uh, but um, I like to promote forests in general to, to people. I, I mean, this is something just to keep repeating for, for everybody to, to understand um, all the benefits that we are getting uh, from forests. And then also to sort of think about this in another way, I saw that there was, there was uh, a, uh, you know, a large amount of landowners here and think about the, the benefits that you all are providing us, um, you know, in, in the state, you know, um, clean air, clean water, you know, um, you know, kind of like the rural aesthetic, you know, enjoyment of the, of the, of the, the landscape, um, the things that we all like kind of know and love about, you know, the rural areas of New York. Uh, you know, and also carbon sequestration and, and of course, forest products and the economic driver that that is for people uh, in the state. So, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of things that you all are providing um, us. And that's the way I've sort of started to change my thinking on this um, over the years. Next slide. So I had mentioned, and I think Neil had, had mentioned our, um, that we had just updated our, our state forest action plan. Um, and in many ways, the forest action plan is something for, um, there, there's sort of a practical reason for it. The forest service has us do the plan and some of our, our funding is tied to it where we, we you know, um, need to kind of connect our programs to it and, and things like that. But it, what the important part of the plan is, it sets sort of the, the direction of, you know, where we're going in New York State with regards to, to, to policy on our forests. What, what are we going to do with our, with our forest resource? How are we going to manage it in the future? We have a 10-year window from now until I retire, <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll do well. <laughs> um, so, so I kind of, we, we put these up before um, when we were doing some forest action plan stuff and it you know, helps New York focus on the most important work or, or, or programs that, um, you know, in the state, identify specific regions uh, or issues that could, could benefit from targeted attention, um, you know, such as Tug Hill, um, you know, or other, other places in the state that could, could use um, so a little more attention. Um, so, and then it helps us and our partners determine what their role is for these, you know, strategies as like, we like to call them, you know, what, you know, how are we going to work together to try to help, you know, take care of this resource and take care of the people that are depending on it. Um, go ahead. So I'm not going to go into this too much. It's just, um, I just want to give you a, a quick overview. This is sort of how we had set up our forest action plan. Um, and this is how we're thinking of it. And we had a big team and, and this is, um, this is actually not, I, this is not mine. This is Sarah Hart. She's the, the, the planner uh, in our shop that really did a lot of work on this. And she did a great job kind of, um, you know, the first thing is here, keep forests as forests, right? So that's our first thing on the top. Um, you know, and then it, and it leads into healthy forests, and then it leads into, you know, forests for people. So what are forests doing for us? You know, and then, you know, what can we do for the forest? 
and then it you know kind of becomes a circle and we have different um, strategies that are going under each of these uh, broader goals. Um, these are these are actually laid out in the forest action plan. Um, I, oh, by the way, finalized uh, forest action plan. So we're pretty proud of that. We got something done during the pandemic, so we're happy about that. Um, so that that's what we're. Uh, this is the goals. This is exactly how it's set up in the action plan. If you if you if you want to check that out, um, you can go ahead. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm only gonna to present a couple of, of the goals because it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of stuff and we, we, can, we just want to give a little overview here. But we just, we just pulled out some, some, some sort of, uh, you know, things from the like, goal one, which is keep New York forests as forests. And this is a lot of, a lot of the things that, that Neil, um, you know, and the Forest Service are working on with their easement programs and the community forest program uh, you know, and that's like the first thing you need to do, right? So you make sure that that forest uh, can stay forest. Uh, and then we have um, a few things here, you know, we talk about carbon um, and the importance of that. And then my favorite one, of course, is always to talk about private forest landowners. So I think you can kind of see it in the bottom. It's the orange circle. It says increase the number of acres of, of private forest land under professional management. Um, currently, we have 1.7 million. It's probably a little higher than that. We want to get it to, to 5 million by 2030. Um, so that's, you know, we want to make sure that when people are harvesting and doing, doing the work on their forest, that they have, you know, they have, um, you know, a knowledgeable professional involved in those, in that work. Um, just feeling like, you know, they're going to do a great job on, on the property and you're going to get the benefit of having that kind of, um, that kind of management. Uh, next slide. So I just, this is the second goal and we, we talk about um, a couple of things that are, that are important uh, from, and we, we repeat a lot in the, in the forest action plan. One of them is keeping forest, uh, the goal is keep New York forest healthy and then we repeat the thing about successful forest regeneration uh, in the forest has been increasingly difficult. Uh, it's not widespread throughout the state, but there are there are there are a lot of areas. Most of the areas, I think it's like 55% um, of the re the regeneration, um, you know, is not adequate for restocking that stand in the future. Um, so that's a pretty alarming number uh, due to various cultural things, um, you know, deer up overpopulation in some places. I, I know that that's not necessarily something that's occurring in the Tug Hill, uh, but it is something, but there are invasive issues, you know, and, and things to look out for. And, and we talk about this as it relates to forest health quite a bit. And that kind of relates back to you all where, you know, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, forest management was, I think, a lot simpler. You know, you followed a, a silvicultural plan, you know, Forester came out, they had some, the scientific management, you know, you, if you, you know, you, all you're doing really when you're managing forests is man, you're managing for light and space, you know, and, um, and so all, that's what you're doing. Now, what's going on is you're, you're, even if you're managing for those things, you're not necessarily getting the regeneration response. You're not getting the little trees to grow because you have issues, um, you know, with deer, with invasive species, or maybe that you have issues with, um, you know, what the soil or, th or issues that we're having throughout the state on regeneration that we're concerned with. And those things are expensive to fix uh, for landowners. And it's, it's very difficult to do that through, um, through the private wood markets. So, you know, it's not something that necessarily pays for itself in the long run with, with uh, just harvesting timber under a civil culture system. There's gonna be, need some assistance with that. Go ahead, next slide. So, 
I wanted to uh, switch a little bit. That's just the general gist of the force action plan. We were talking talk about re- landowners a lot. We talk about regeneration a lot, and we talk about professional management. And the reason is uh, just to to put this. Um, this is updated numbers that we had gotten from the Forest Service. So, um, uh, so you know, the gist of it of of this table is private forest landowners landowners rule. They have the most. You know, they have the most acres. There's the most potential to do good on those acres. They're going to make the biggest difference in all the goals we ever have um, with with regards to our forests. So, in my view, we should be paying attention to you more. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, I guess I'm paid to say that. So, um, but I really do believe it. So, go ahead. Next slide. Um, just some basics on, on the forest um, slide. We had talked about the 18.6 million acres. Um, that's actually lower than, than the last uh, measurement period from, from uh, 2014 um, by a little bit, but we've lost around 300,000 net acres. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a decrease and there's some reasons for that. Some of it has to do with ag uh, conversion and some of it has to do with uh, conversion from from develop you know into development. Uh, but the resource that's there, I mean, it's a it's a slight decrease. It's something to to definitely monitor, and then we're, we're you know we're concerned with. Um, it's the first time it's go- gone down um, in a long time, as far as how many acres of forest we have in the state. So it's something to keep an eye on, uh, and and we are. Um, one of the things uh, to know about the resource is that we're growing 2.6 trees for every one tree that is harvested in the state. Um, you know, so we're grow- we're still growing, you know, more trees than we're harvesting by by a, by a pretty pretty broad margin. You know, none of the species are below uh, what with the one ratio. If you dip dip below one, you're you're not you know, you're basically harvesting more than you're growing back. None of the species in the state were at that, are at that point at this, at this stage. So we're doing well. Um, we're doing well at this point. So, yep, thanks. <laughs> um, and we had gone over a little bit of this before, just, uh, just some more stats. Um, so 74% of New York's forests are privately owned. Uh, nearly 700,000 uh, landowners uh, own 13.6 million acres. Um, 9.3 million acres of the private forest with uh, have 10 acres or more. So there's a decent amount that actually have less than that, right? Um, you know, small, really small parcels and stuff like that that we that we have to come up maybe with different ways to talk talk about their forests. Um, so we have about you know. 187 or you know about almost 200,000 private landowners with 10 acres or more um so we have a little bit less to to, to sort of talk about and, th- and that's an important number kind of in my mind because once you get kind of over 10 15 acres then you're then you can talk about uh being able to, to manage the land and and get some benefit from from uh forest management um and the, the tools that we can use are, are different than for the people that have less. Um, so one of the things to, to sort of uh, to focus on, and this is from the National uh, Woodland Owner Survey, is that only around 25% of surveyed landowners in New York State have used a forester for a harvest. And then I have a little question, what is a forester? And that and that kind of brings up, you know, we don't really have um, we don't really have a state definition of a forester. Um, you, know, you know, New York State doesn't say this is what a forester is. Uh, we do have some definitions in in some of our programs. You know, a forester isn't a logger, um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get a good harvest from a logger. You can. Um, you can get get professional management in, you know, from a logger and from a forester. Um, I've had better, you know, and you can get bad harvest from a forester and a, and a logger too, uh, no doubt. But on average, we feel like if you hire a forester, you're going to have 
somebody working for you that's that's um you know for you know looking after your goals so they're looking at the little lot they're looking at the job they're making sure that those things are um you know they're looking making sure that the you know they're not there's not a mess being created um you're getting the the forest management that you want as a landowner so so as a, i'm going to say this again to impact um you know, New York's forest resource, we must address private forest management in New York and trying to get, uh, you know, you know, raise, just raise the bar of professional management in the entire state. You know, you know, we're going to have some changes maybe coming from the climate act where we're going to have to manage for carbon or, or that we're going to, you know, want to be managing for carbon. We're going to need foresters to do that. You know, we're going to need natural resource professionals to do that sort of work. So those things are important for the future too. So just to get into some of the programs from New York, um, some of our stuff um, here at DEC is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund. Um, this, this slide, a couple of these slides were pro provided by Jeff Napes, who Neil, Neil has for the contact for his program. Um, he, Jeff Napes, he works in our um, easement programs and he's uh, one of our policy uh, people uh, at DEC that works with me. Um, on land acquisition stuff and, and things like that. So this is just a general breakdown of how how the, the EPF is doled out, um, you know, since 1993. Um, we don't have to spend that much time on this. Um, and just to kind of get back um, on the state level programs, uh, similar to what um, Neil has actually. We have a community forest program. It's named the exact same thing. It was it was uh, passed last year in um, in our budget, and we haven't gone out with it. And it's it's a, you know it's so it's so a community can buy you know like purchase a, a forest, um, and that includes like a school uh, things like that. It's a cost share. I believe it's I think it's I can't remember what was funded. I think it was five hundred thousand um, dollars at the first level, but I don't think we've rolled it out yet. Uh, so be looking out for something like that. Uh, we have the New York State Conservation Partnership Program, which helps build, uh, the way that Jeff explained it to me, helps, be, uh, helps build capacity uh, with the land trust and then do some stewardship activities. Um, you know, land trusts are also partners with us in land acquisition, um, you know, partnerships when we're trying to, you know, get some, you know, get bigger pieces of land, they hold that sometimes they hold them for us for a while. And then we, you know, finish until we can finish the purchase. Um, there's the conservation easement tax credits, um, state and federal credits, I could talk a little bit about the state, I think that it's capped at like $5,000, something like that, for having a land trust. And then you know, what is the role for our land trusts moving forward? You know, agricultural land protection, technical assistance, land stewardship partnerships with local governments. And then uh, Jeff had riparian buffer protection. Um, so next slide, Katie. So um, switching gears a little bit. So just, uh, I am the private lands bureau or private lands uh, section head here at DC and we have uh, regional staff throughout the steps, throughout the uh, state um, that uh, are service foresters and they'll, they will serve um, pr to provide you with free technical advice and, ser and services um, and assistance uh, to New York landowners. So, you know, you can call them and they will come out and they will visit your property. You'll take the day, you walk. I'm sure some of, maybe some of you have even done that. Um, it, it's a great day. Uh, we always enjoyed being able to just teach people about forestry or, or you know, or what they're, just what their land is. Uh, the best part I think about the program is that it's voluntary, which means that when we go out to your property, you know, it's sort of your day. You, you kind of talk to us about your goals, and then we we sort of see how you know how what your property. Um, you know, we, I call it kind of a resource assessment. See what it'll handle. You know, what will your your property uh, 
you know, be, be able to provide based on your goals. Uh, what, you know, what's the current condition? Is there, you know, it's, is there any forest pest issues that you have? Um, and then we, we often will, will, will uh, write a plan for you, or sometimes we don't. Sometimes we'll just refer. If you're if you're interested in doing a harvest, we might refer to a to a to a uh, private um, uh, consulting forester uh, for those services. At that point, we often we often um, you know call it like the first step towards long term forest stewardship. So usually people don't necessarily know about forestry or forests. They call us. We come we can at least, at least get you started on the programs that are, you know, may, may require more of a commitment. The great thing about the stewardship program is there isn't really a commitment. You can, you can, you know, we can provide you with, you know, some advice and you're free to take it or not take it. <laughs> and uh, I think people really like that. We also get a decent amount of people that will go ahead and do a practice off of just doing our stewardship visits. And it's not necessarily um, a lot of people or it's not necessarily the most expensive practices, but we do get that. And then we also get people to, to sign up for our other programs, tax law, maybe a cost share program, uh, things like that. So we've, we feel like this is um, sort of our core mission uh, here in private lands. And um, I did forget to put our contact list for our regional staff up. So hopefully maybe we can do that at the end or something like that. Yeah, Jason, um, we can either put that in the chat or um, put, I, I'll send an email out to all the participants afterwards with the slide deck and we can do that. And just so you know, we're running short on your time. So um, okay. we might have to speed it up a tad, thanks. Okay, yep, go ahead. So uh, real property tax law, I you know, noticed there was somebody here um, that was in tax law. Uh, it's enacted in 1974. Uh, and the goal is to, to provide um, a tax abatement for filing a DC approved management plan uh, written by a consultant forester to produce timber crops. Uh, and that's the purpose of the law that, that was, it was set up in that time um, for a faltering timber industry here in New York. Um, so the goal is, you know, the goal is, is to, to, to produce timber, but we get lots of different benefits from that. You know, we do get some open space protection uh, from forest tax law. Um, we also, of course, get the wildlife uh, benefits of doing some harvesting uh, and things like that. Um, we do have a fairly low participation rate compared to the amount of acres that we have. And that is because of the high acres threshold of 50 and then our stringent requirements and their steep penalties. Um, so that's the kind of bad part. And we are trying to fix this. This has been an ongoing mission. Uh, we've lost about a year because of the pandemic, but we're still on the job trying to get this fixed so that um, we have a better forest tax law for everybody to participate in. Um, and just to remind you, as much as forest tax law might be um, something that needs to be improved, it still is forest stewardship. And, and we consider it that um, in our, it, take, it makes up for about half, the, half of the stewardship that we do in the state. Next slide. So we had talked about this before. This is a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, red is bad <laughs> for regeneration. Uh, so that's something to, to sort of look at. Um, most of this has that is being driven by the deer, um, the deer pressure in the southern part of the state at this point. This was in map uh, done by the Nature Conservancy recently and was put in the Forest Action Plan. And it's, as we st stated before, it's a, it's a main goal of the Forest Action Plan. Go ahead. And because it's a main goal, we have Regenerate New York, which we actually have. So, so we last year we postponed this. This is a cost share program for landowners um, to sign up for, to do, to do practices uh, um, for securing regeneration on your private forest. Uh, we have a, about $500,000 allocated from the 2019 year. That's all we have permission to spend right now. And we're looking at uh, rolling that out 
this summer. I hate to even say anything, but I'm going to say it this summer. So I'm working on it. Um, and the four practices are, you know, basically planting trees, uh, forest stand restoration. So if you have a severely degraded stand, uh, doing some silviculture practices to sort of get that, that stand growing again. Uh, competing vegetation control, if you have some invasive uh, issues, uh, you know, with the, the you know, hurting your regeneration, um, you know, we're going to help you try to take care of that. And then deer exposures, deer fence, including um, natural slash walls, which is sort of an experimental um, aspect of this program. So go ahead. So um, if you do regenerate New York, you're going to have to uh, hire a, a private forester to manage that, um, that grant. Um, and you, you could do it through our co uh, cooperating forester program. We have 83 private consulting industrial foresters participating in our program. It's our critical partnership for delivering professional services. They make up for about half of our stewardship that we do in the state. Um, is done by a private consulting forester because it's tax law, <laughs> mostly. Um, so you have to have a four-year degree in forestry or forest management. Um, you have to have 20 continuing cred uh, education credits every two years, which I did not put there. Uh, you also must adhere to the Society of American Foresters Code of Ethics, even if, it, even if you are not a member. So they have a code of ethics at SAF. So you're getting somebody that 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 is hopefully following those ethic those ethical codes. Um, you are also promoting scientific forestry and BMPs for sustainable management of our forest lands. Uh, this program is also voluntary, um, and so we maintain our list on our website. Next slide, please. Ah, I'm sure Katie likes to see this. Um, so, uh, yes, this is the Climate Leadership and Protection Act, uh, which has got ambitious goals um, of reducing carbon emissions 85% uh, by 2050, 40% by 2030. Um, natural working lands, including your private forests, have a huge role to play in this on the sequestration and the carbon sequestration side. So trees, you know, Forests and trees are really the largest scale thing taking up forest carbon here in New York. You are providing the most benefit for this right now. Uh, 26 million uh, metric tons of carbon is being sucked out of the atmosphere right now on forests. And most of that's on private land. And that's what we've been talking about. Um, we're on um, our working groups, uh, working with the, the climate office at DEC uh, to develop, um, you know, what our strategies we can we can have to increase the sequestration on forest lands. So for us, mainly, it's doing all the things I said better, doing better forest management, having better regeneration, maybe getting rid of a few deer here and there, um, things like that, making sure we have forests as forests. Um, so those are three really important things right there. So um, one, of the, one of the biggest cost shares, I would say, or the biggest economic drivers for, for helping forests remain for us is forest utilization. So if you can sell timber from your forest, you, you are able to keep your land and you're able to do some of these practices that are expensive to do. Um, like spraying for invasive species or fencing in from deer so your regeneration is, is, um, is protected. Over $300 million a year in stumpage payments um, to New York's forest landowners. There's no way that a government cost share program can re ever replace that. It's, it's too much, it's too important, you know, wood already is is helping sequester wood. You know, long t you know sequester that carbon long term because they're long term wood products. Um, so they're they're helping in that way as well. Um, 
And as far as I'm concerned, this is something that, that we need to sort of uh, beat the drum on a little more. Um, that industry really can help here uh, quite a bit uh, on uh, you know providing sustainable and that and that's the key. It's got to be sustainable, right? So you got to be able to be growing as much as you're harvesting always. Um, so we do this forest stewardship pro uh, utilization program. Um, we create the the timber production report every year for the industry. We do it every, every year. It's up on our website now. We also do a stumpage price report for landowners. There, it's um, it's two times a year, January and June. So those are the important things for the landowners. Okay, um, next slide. So here are your 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 map for your sites for New York State. So they're all over, which is good. And you can see um, you can see we have you know much more hardwood sites here in New York State than softwoods. But up here, um, you know, up up in the northern part of the state, there's there's more softwood resource. Um, so that's all I wanted to sort of say here. I just wanted to mention that. Here's an example of the reports you can you can see, um, and then you can click on these. I have a link at the end. You can really look at these closer. Go ahead. So as I said, our challenges are forest regeneration is struggling in many parts parts of the state, um, and we also you know New York State also has you know we're the we're the epicenter of of invasive species in the country, so we have kind of unprecedented forest health challenges generally, you know, emerald ash borer, uh, Albany, or um, Asian longhorn beetle, things like that, that we have to be concerned about, oak wilt. Um, sound management, forest management is more expensive than in the past, and the resources to get to forest reverse to 13 million acres of forest land is pretty, pretty, um, it's a pretty, uh, big ask to get to all those acres. And just remember, no wood markets, no stewardship. So you need the wood markets to do the stewardship. And this is my coming soon. And I'm just going to leave it at that coming soon. <laughs> uh, I put the links up here, the forest action plan, private forest management, private forest management will have the links to our staff on it. Um, and then forest products utilization. Sorry, I was rushed. <laughs> um, all right, I rushed through. No, that thank you, too thank much. you, Jason. That was a uh, really great information, and uh, I think these links will be useful for people to to dive deeper in after the presentation. So, thank you. Um, yep. So we'll switch to thank Linda. You, yep. Oh, and there's one more. You had one more slide there. 488 participation by town, which it was just uh, is interesting. One. It was just an extra <laughs> one to answer a question. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Okay, so um, I'll try and move through mine pretty quickly since we're over time already. Um, so just a note on this, um, the, where the region is that we're talking about and that 85% of the land on Tug Hill is privately owned. Next slide. Um, we have 41 towns that we're working with um, and most of the population is in our villages around the edges. Next slide, Katie. Um, Tyke Hill Tomorrow Land Trust, we're a regional not-for-profit. Not we're 30 years old this year. Um, and we work in Jefferson, Lewis, Oswego, and Oneida counties, um, mostly in the Tyke Hill portions, but also around the outside um, when there's no other organization. Okay. And our mission is to protect the wildlands, working forests and farms of the region um, and promote, promote the appreciation of the region's natural and cultural heritage. So we've always had a two-pronged two approach of education and land protection. Um, one of the things that we've always been for, focused on is Tyke Hill's core forest. It's been our priority since the beginning. Um, and it's also a priority in New York State's open space plan and a lot of other um, organizations and plans identify the core forest of Tyke Hill as being really important, Audubon's one. Um, and we just recently did this part of Tyke Hill piece. If you're interested, it's on our website and we can also mail you a copy if you'd like a hard copy of it. 
Thank you. Um, so, like we had talked in previous um, webinars, if you were on our previous web webinars, we, we protect um, agricultural land, wild lands, but we also protect forests. Um, and we do that really um, through accepting donated conservation easements. Um, New York State just um, passed um, in the budget, it was in last year's and but was never enacted and then um, hopefully it'll pass in this year a working forest conservation easement program, um, which would be similar to um, the ag land um, purchase of development rights for the ag land so to protect forest land. Um, we also work with forest landowners to help them understand sound forest management practices. So we're talking about, um, we've been talking about a lot of how, how much power the private forest owners have um, and how much responsibility they have. So um, about 20% of Tyke Hill lands, that's a mix of ag and forests are already protected either through public ownership or conservation easements. Just talking a little bit about what um, a conservation easement is, what a donated conservation easement is. These are kind of all the same, um, donated or purchased. It is a voluntary agreement. It's legal between the landowner and the land trust. We work together to, um, to come up with what is in that agreement. Um, they are forever. They're filed with the deed at the county office. Um, so anybody that owns the land in the future um, knows that that is part of that land and has to be, um, has to follow whatever that easement says. Linda, I'm gonna interrupt you right here because sure. I think this might be a good spot for you to answer a question. Um, sure. If a land trust dissolve, dissolves, what uh -huh. happens to the lands invo involved? So um, that's a good question. Um, it really depends on what kinds of lands they hold, but, um, what would happen is it would go through the courts and those easements would either go to the state or to another um, land trust organization that was that was nearby. Um, but those easements would still remain um, in effect. So someone else would take the responsibility of those over. We have agreements with some other land trusts that if some of our easements went, if we went under that they would um, be willing to take over our our um, conservation easements, but it would be Thank done to the courts. So we um, work with the landowner to determine what their vision of the property is and what resources um, there are there that that we should be protecting. Um, there has to be some public benefit to that to those um, protecting those resources. And it does restrict the use of the property to protect those natural resources. And the cool thing about conservation easements is they're individually tailored. No two conservation easements are alike. Um, people do it usually because they love their land. Um, they've had it in their family for generations and it gives them peace of mind to know that it will continue to be the way that they envision it, um, the, what they've worked for generations to um, create. Um, there are a lot of community benefits. We've talked a little bit about that, you know, clean air, clean water. Um, some easements allow for um, like a trail to go through. So there's, sometimes there's public benefits. Um, and there's also tax benefits to um, doing a conservation easement. And it leaves a lasting legacy. Um, so working forest conservation easements, the easements that we have that have forests on them, um, if if you want to harvest your timber commercially, then you are going to have to have um, a, a cooperative consulting forester. Um, and we've already talked a lot about log loggers versus foresters, but we feel it's really important to make sure that um, you're getting the best um, help that you can to manage your forest and that it's done in a sustainable way. And um, we've heard time and time again, not using a forester can result in some pretty bad situations. Not that all, and again, I think um, Jason said it, you can have bad loggers, you can have bad foresters, but um, a forester is really looking out for your best benefit, for your best interests. Um, that's their priority, so that's what their job is. Um, and we do require, if you're gonna harvest timber, to have a forest management plan and a harvest plan. 
<clears throat> there are income tax benefits, federal income tax deduction. When you put the conservation easement on, the value of that conservation easement is like giving a donation to a um, charitable organization and you can deduct that um, over 16 years. So a lot of times, a lot of landowners are land rich, cash poor. They don't have a lot of income to, to offset those deductions. So they can spread it out over quite a bit of time to, to hopefully maximize that. And there's also an annual income tax credit um, that's equal to 25% of your property tax on the land. And that's up to $5,000 a year. And that goes to the success of landowners. So if you sell that land, if it was a donated conservation easement, those new landowners would qualify for that tax credit. And you can put your land in a conservation easement, even if it is also in 480A. We have quite a few of our forest lands that are in 480A. Okay, Katie. <clears throat> so this is a poll question. We can do this pretty quick. You wanna pop it up? I'm um, trying. What you think is the most important benefit of a well-managed forest? Um, and we've got choices, wildlife habitat, clean water, jobs, recreation, economic impact, clean air, and carbon sequestration. Can people see that poll? Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe everybody bailed. Waking everybody up here. Do I Do get a, a few more seconds? You can guess, go ahead. It's really a preference, I guess, because I think they're all yeah. benefits, but what's the most yeah. important to you? So here we'll end the polling and share the results. So it looks like wildlife uh, habitat yeah. um, awesome. really won. Nice. Okay. Carbon. Carbon got a yeah. couple of mentions, yeah. so that's good. So there's, there are all of those are benefits of a well-managed forest. So um, like Jason was saying, a lot of us don't own forest land, but we get the benefits of it anyways. Um, and we've gone through this already a ton of times. So these are all benefits of a properly managed forest. We do have a Tug Hill Forest Owner's Handbook um, that we did uh, several years ago with the Nature Conservancy and we have a pretty good supply. So if anyone is interested in, in getting a copy of that, if you just wanna put that in the chat, we'll send it to you. Um, I think we have from registering to, for this a webinar, we have all of your contact information. And also on DEC's website is the um, best management practices for wa water quality, which we supply to all of our forest land, all of our landowners who are managing timber on their land to for them to follow as a guide. Yeah, so put your name in the chat if you'd like a copy of our forest landowners handbook. And if you want a copy of our um, part of Tuck Hill um, piece as well, we can send you that along with that. So thank you for sticking with me. Um, anybody have any questions? I don't see any um, questions in the chat. Let me double check. Oh, here's something popping in. Um, Bill Christ, Bill, do you have a question? Oh, Bill wants, wants Bill wants a, a landowners, of course, landowners. Yeah. Uh, right. but, so we'll get you one, Bill. Yeah. And you can also just email me if you'd like a copy of that. And I can, I can send that off to you. Just email me your name and at where you want me to send it. And I can do that. Thank you guys. You want to do the uh, natural history guide? Yeah. So, yep. We'll, um, we'll pick a couple people to get a uh, natural history field guide. We've got um, John Alfano. John's here. We'll get you one of those in the mail. And our second one will go to uh, Sandra Groff. Sandra, you're going to receive a book in the mail. So Excellent. Uh, any last questions? I'm sorry when we went a little over, but we had a lot of really good information. I found that very, very useful. Kind of something else in the chat here. Thanks. Oh, just a thanks. So. Well, Neil and Jason, thank you so much for agreeing to, to to do this because um, it's really great to get the three perspectives um, on the different levels and all the different programs that are available for not only forest landowners, but for um, municipalities. And, and um, I think this was really useful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks guys. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining. <laughs>